1965 Super Outbreak Review based on the book theory. So today we're going to do a little bit of review of the 1965 tornado disaster that happened in Indiana and several states in the U.S. And also, you can get this book from Amazon. So once again, we're going to listen to the audio that happened on the 1965 Palm Sunday tornadoes in Indiana. And again, you can get this book from Amazon. All right, now without the way, now let's listen to the audio, what really happened on that year, 1965, during this tornado disaster. April 11th, 1965. It's a beautiful sunny afternoon across northern Indiana, and residents all across the state are beginning to venture outdoors to enjoy the pleasant spring weather after a long and brutal winter. None of them could have imagined that in just a few short hours, they would be at the center of one of the worst tornado outbreaks in American history. It's April 10th, and meteorologists working at the U.S. Weather Bureau's Severe Local Storms Unit, or SELS, are monitoring a massive wave of low pressure, called a trough, that is moving in over the central United States, bringing with it a large zone of fast-moving winds in the mid-levels of the atmosphere. This powerful trough generates an unseasonably strong surface low pressure system called a mid-latitude cyclone, drawing in not only warm moist air from the Gulf of Mexico, but also a layer of warm dry air aloft originating from the desert southwest called the Elevated Mix Layer, or EML. As these air masses begin to migrate to the northeast, the EML begins to overspread an expansive plume of warm moist air, placing a capping inversion, or lid, on the atmosphere. This capping inversion is preventing the warm moist air near the surface from rising and forming clouds, allowing the sun to continue heating up the air near the surface and creating a very unstable atmosphere with the amount of energy available for thunderstorms rising to over 1,000 joules per kilogram. At the same time, the rapidly strengthening surface low pressure system is drawing in a powerful low-level jet of air rushing north while the winds just above turn rapidly towards the east and spread apart with height generating record levels of wind shear, measuring over 100 knots in the lowest 6 kilometers of the atmosphere. These meteorological factors are coming together to create a volatile atmosphere that will cause any storms that develop to organize into powerful, long-lived thunderstorms with rapidly rotating updrafts called supercells, capable of producing long-track, violent tornadoes. It's now 12.30 p.m., and the meteorologist at the SCLS office in Kansas City noting that all the key ingredients of a devastating tornado outbreak have fallen into place over the Midwest, issue a severe weather forecast statement for northern Illinois, eastern Iowa, and southern Wisconsin, noting the possibility of supercell thunderstorms capable of producing powerful tornadoes. And only a few minutes later, that terrible possibility would come true. Just before 1 p.m., a region of extremely fast-moving winds aloft within the larger trough called a jet streak overspreads the cold front into the open warm sector, and the capping inversion that has been holding down the powder keg of instability below it breaks. The first tornado of the day would reach the Earth at 12.55 p.m. Central Standard Time, just northeast of Tipton, Iowa, and track for roughly 32 miles, obliterating numerous farms at violent intensity before lifting near Springbrook, Iowa, taking a man's life with it. The same supercell thunderstorm responsible for the violent tornado near Springbrook cycled and produced another family of tornadoes, including a twister that hit Monroe, Wisconsin, damaging numerous structures, including a hotel which had its roof removed, and another near Evansville that tracked for 23 miles before producing a strong tornado near Jefferson, Wisconsin, reaching over three quarters of a mile wide, leveling a forest, tossing cars off the roads, and destroying numerous buildings. The tornado would track for a total of 14 miles, claiming three lives before dissipating near Ashipun. Further to the south, another cluster of supercells formed over northern Illinois, 
spawning several damaging tornadoes, including a strong tornado that struck near Druce Lake, and a devastating tornado that formed near the Crystal Lake area, damaging or destroying numerous structures, tossing large vehicles through the air, completely sweeping away several homes, and scattering both debris and victims considerable distances away. The tornado cleaned the lives of six people, leaving behind terrible destruction. However, the nightmare was only just beginning. It's now 4 p.m., and the conditions in the open warm sector ahead of the cold front are rapidly deteriorating into one of the most volatile atmospheres for tornadoes ever seen over the Midwest. And at 4.20 p.m., the SELS unit issued another severe weather forecast for a portion of this area over northern Indiana to northwestern Ohio and southern Michigan, expecting strong tornadoes. Only a few minutes later, more supercells exploded along the cold front in northeastern Illinois and quickly drifted to the northeast. One of these storms became dominant and at 4.45 p.m. produced its first tornado. The tornado reached the earth as a narrow funnel near Hamlet before causing its first major damage near Coons Lake, damaging or destroying hundreds of structures and continued to gradually widen. It then passed near the outskirts of the town of La Paz, where several photographs were taken of the tornado by the Indiana State Police, showing the tornado as a brilliant white tube moving quickly across the farmland. However, as the La Paz tornado is beginning to weaken, the same parent supercell thunderstorm cycles and produces a second, even more violent and far more infamous tornado three miles to its southeast. Twin twisters were now tearing through northern Indiana. At 5.18 p.m., the southern twin rapidly strengthened as it slammed into the town of Wakarusa, Indiana, causing severe damage to many structures and claiming the life of a child before racing off to the northeast. At 5.24 p.m., the La Paz tornado to the north dissipates as the rapidly strengthening tornado just to its south begins to close in on the town of Midway. What followed is one of the most iconic moments in the history of violent tornadoes. At 5.30 p.m., reporter Paul Huffman and his wife Betty are traveling northwest on U.S. Route 33 when they suddenly notice the swirling dark cloud of the approaching twister. As the monster approaches, Paul takes a series of six photographs showing the tornado splitting into twin funnels orbiting around each other as the tornado obliterates the midway trailer court, claiming the lives of ten people and injuring countless others. Past Midway, the tornado raced to the northeast, obliterating the small subdivision of Jefferson Place, killing several more before slamming into the outskirts of the town of Middlebury, tossing cars and destroying numerous homes before finally dissipating just northwest of the main part of town, claiming the lives of 31 people. Yet, at the same time the Midway tornado is devastating the community of Wakarusa, 60 miles back to the west, another long-track powerful supercell trailing just behind the first strengthens and at 5.10 p.m. produces the first tornado in a devastating tornado family that will continue for the next 200 miles. The tornado caused no visible damage for the first 14 miles of its life before strengthening considerably as it approached the town of South Wanata and was photographed by a nearby local, appearing as a tall cone tornado with a debris cloud at the surface while destroying several rural homes and barns, several of which were destroyed at near violent intensity. However, the tornado thankfully remained quite narrow and caused minimal damage and no fatalities as it tracked through a mostly rural area, leaving severe damage in its wake. Meanwhile, back to the east, at the same time the Midway tornado is beginning to weaken, its parent supercell once again cycles and produces yet another tornado five miles to its south at 5.40 p.m. Starting out as a waterspout over the Goshen Pond, the tempest caused no visible damage for the first eight miles of its track before rapidly intensifying as the storm destroyed several farms near Indiana State Road 13. The tornado then struck the community of Rainbow Lake just south of Shipshawana, causing devastating damage as it obliterated 12 homes and swept their foundations clean of debris, killing 17 people. Those who lived to tell their stories described the tornado as a cage of serpents writhing around a central point that evolved into a large beast with tentacle-like appendages reaching out horizontally, the unmistakable sign of a multiple vortex tornado. The tornado traveled for another 20 miles before finally dissipating around 6 p.m. However, from here, the outbreak turned it up to 11. Around the same time that the Shipshawana tornado is beginning to dissipate, more supercells erupt ahead of the cold front in west central Indiana, while at the same time, the storms previously responsible for the outbreak of tornadoes in Illinois begin to make landfall in Michigan, once again producing tornadoes, the most significant of which would strike near Allendale, Michigan, inflicting moderate to severe damage to a few homes before becoming violent near the Comstock Park area, just north of Grand Rapids, destroying over 200 homes with catastrophic intensity and claiming the lives of five people. 
Meanwhile, back to the south in Indiana, the supercell responsible for the ship Shawana tornado once again cycles and produces another tornado at 6 p.m., while at the same time, one of the supercells initiating ahead of the cold front further to the south in central Indiana rapidly intensifies and at 6.07 p.m., produces the first in a family of tornadoes that will continue for the next 274 at homes, sweeping their foundations clean, ripping the grass out of its roots, tossing vehicles for hundreds of yards through the air, and scattering both debris and victims into the lake, resulting in 18 deaths. A picture of the tornado was taken near this area, showing the massive tornado looming in the distance as it grouped nearly two miles wide and ripped a large steel tank from its anchoring and threw it over half a mile away. At the same moment, 100 miles to the southwest, the tornado that has just formed south of Middle Fork rapidly intensifies and grows to three quarters of a mile wide prior to impacting the town of Russiaville. The tornado obliterated the small community, destroying over 90% of the structures in town before expanding to over one mile wide and crashed into the nearby towns of Alto and Kokomo, becoming violent. The tornado devastated the two communities, destroying over 100 homes along its track before growing even stronger as it impacted the community of Greentown, Indiana, and caused incredible damage to numerous structures. The tornado struck with such fury that homes were completely leveled and swept away, trees were completely debarked and denutted, vehicles were thrown for hundreds of yards, and the grass was scoured from the ground. The tornado would claim the lives of 18 people and injured over 600 others in this area before moving on to the east and leaving behind peculiar circular scratches in the ground called cycloidal marks before passing through the southern edge of the city of Marion, decimating more structures with a few being completely swept away and heavily damaging both a hospital and a shopping center. In all, the tornado would cause the deaths of 25 people and injured over 800 more before finally lifting near the small community of Arcana. Just to the south, at the same time the Russiaville tornado is striking the town of Alto, the supercell just to its south produces its first tornado at 6.36 p.m., just southeast of Crawfordsville, claiming its for mile wide as it approached the northern edge of the town of Lebanon. The mile-wide tornado devastated the small community north of town, obliterating more than 50 homes, lofting vehicles over 100 yards, and leveling a shopping center before racing off to the east where it struck the town of Sheridan with brutal force, obliterating numerous homes and sweeping their foundations clean with the debris granulated to small shards and trees were debarked. In total, the tornado would be responsible for the deaths of 28 people and injured over 100 others before finally dissipating just south of Arcadia. Alright guys, and that is it for this video today, and hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. Make sure you have these guys hit that like and subscribe button. This is my future videos, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye